welcome back to my channel and welcome back to my incredibly messy bedroom. I have been getting so many fantastic questions coming in over on my Instagram channel. I put up a question box asking you what sort of specific topics or questions you would like me to answer in a sort of Q&A style regarding gentle parenting, positive parenting and things that have come up in your day-to-day -day life. So I think I'm going to have to break this into two whole videos because I've gotten so many fantastic questions coming in. But I'm going to dive right in and see how many I can get done in this video. Um, so keep an eye out if it was your question that maybe you submitted. And some of these are so great, so I cannot wait to give you my ideas and suggestions and tips on how I would approach the answers to these questions from a gentle parenting perspective. So one of the first questions that I got was about having a very fussy or picky eater. I've actually written down all the questions here and this person says my two-year-old has gotten through such a stage of fussy eating that they will only eat beige food. Um, how to handle this? And I suppose the first thing is just to kind of come back and normalize this behavior. So um, particularly between the ages of two to five, your child may or may not go through a phase of just fussy eating, picky eating, where they have maybe foods that they feel safe eating, they feel comfortable eating and other foods that they don't recognize maybe they don't like the texture of and they will just completely not go to um the first thing in terms of suggestions on how to manage this and how to encourage a really positive meal time and come back to your child eating more than just a few types of food is to outrule something else. So oftentimes if you notice it's particularly like sensory stuff or if your child is maybe having like safe foods that they want to bring with them maybe to like birthday parties or if it's a case of there being less than seven overall types of food that they will actually eat sometimes it's worthwhile linking in with your care provider maybe with a speech and language therapist to outrule some um and medical issues that could be going on there if your child is maybe gagging excessively over foods um it can also be a sign that there's something going on so making sure that you're getting the correct sort of support and just listening to your gut if you if, if it's telling you that um there's something maybe more going on there do seek the support that you and your child need and deserve that being said, we have dealt with fussy eating in our house. Actually, Jess in particular was super fussy. And the way that we approached that was instead of making a song and a dance about it, instead of focusing on making mealtimes a battle, we would make it actually quite the opposite. So we make we made sure that the focus was on us spending time together as a family unit. So if you've seen some of my previous videos, you know we always um, focus on family meal times. So if that means that one of us can't be there. So for instance, if I'm working, Pete will always sit down with the kids and he will have his meal at the same time. So not only is he giving that really good example for um, how you know, he's sitting down and trying all of the all of the foods on his plate and, you know, good table manners and all the rest. We also spend a lot of time catching up, conversing, chatting. We always ask each other and we'll do like a round robin of like, how was your day? What was your favorite part of your day? So it's making sure that it's fostering this really positive outlook around mealtimes and that it's not focused. And in fact, we won't ever mention if a child finishes their plate or eats all of their vegetables just in the same way that if they were to eat like a whole slice of cake we would we, we, you know we wouldn't say like oh well done you ate your whole slice of cake all food is treated the same um, and we don't ever comment on the amount of food or them trying something so if they try something new we oftentimes will we'll do our best to like even though we're doing a little dance inside that like oh my gosh Atticus tried the sushi we won't even acknowledge it or like look at it and just like secretly high secretly high five each other under the table if we need to. Um, so we're making sure that way that we're instilling this really positive attitude towards food and not making a bigger deal of it so that then it becomes less of a big deal for the kid as well. And they are more likely to try new things down the line um, in, in knowing that it's just a phase. The other thing that we will do in terms of the idea of there being like, well, how do you make sure your kid gets enough food at, at dinner? And I will always prepare. I don't get into a thing of like preparing several different meals for several different kids in several different ways for us as a slightly bigger family. So we've got oftentimes three kids eating at the table with us. We will just do one dinner for everyone and I will make sure that within that dinner there is at least one part that all of the kids will eat or that each kid each kid will eat so for instance if we're doing like 
maybe chili and rice and like tortillas or wraps or something like that that even if it's just the rice that they will eat we know there's at least one like safe food on their plate and if all they eat for that meal time is the rice that's totally okay if they maybe eat rice and a little bit of corn that's also okay we make it that it's about fostering a really positive approach to mealtimes and a family-centered approach as opposed to it being like something that's forced or something that they can have negative associations with so always offering other foods continuing to offer I remember hearing once that it takes at least 10 times of trying a new food with a new texture a new flavor before you can actually begin to like it or enjoy it so we will continue to offer avocado even if Arika says he doesn't like avocado uh, and then eventually it'll be something that they they grow upon and they enjoy um, from a weaning perspective as well we have always done baby led weaning so never separate meals never purees honestly it was out of ease for me I didn't want to have to be doing that extra job I was busy enough but it was really really helpful then in terms of we were always offering foods that us as a family would eat so it meant that he was but, but the boys were exposed to family style meals, family style flavours and textures that they would later on be exposed to as opposed to it being like a new thing. So jumping from like, you know, baby rice or pureed apple to like a full on curry uh, would be a big transition for a baby who's never had those flavours before. So in introducing, incorporating herbs and spices into their meals from early on and different textures and different flavours and letting them play with their food. One of the biggest things that I have noticed is that none of my kids have any sensory issues because they were exposed to food put right in front of them and they could just smear it everywhere, squish it in their hands, rub it through their hair, um, which for a lot of us can be really like triggering. But we would do that at least once a day, if not every meal and just let them get completely messy. And if we needed to like pop them in the sink and give them a little hose down. But it was really, really helpful. And there's some fantastic research that I'll try and find the links to for um, in the description box that shows that those kids who were exposed to messy food play earlier on had significantly less sort of sensory issues down the line. So very, very good. So following on from that food related question, I also got a question about throwing a food and you know my little one gets into their high chair and as soon as they're finished eating they automatically go to like throwing their food on the ground uh, and they think it's a game and how do we get them to stop this and not think that it's like a fun thing and I suppose the first thing is if you um if you know a little bit about infant development watching and observing and learning how things move in space is a really normal developmental milestone uh, and kids love to throw things and it's a lot of fun and it's also really interesting and it's play and learning and play are so highly integrated for children. So it just means you've got a really clever kid. Um, in terms of knowing whether it is appropriate or not, you want to be doing two things. You want to be making sure that you have space for your child to learn and move in that way. So if that's their only opportunity to throw, they're going to throw at dinner time. So if you are noticing that they're doing that at dinner time, that you're making space for maybe pom-poms to be thrown around at some point during the day, or lots of water play so they can throw and splash and learn that way, or a soft ball maybe in the garden at some point during the day, or getting them out to the playground where they can climb up and down the climbing frame and move their bodies and throw their bodies in the space and figure it out that way. So you're giving them plenty of opportunity to use that energy in a safe way that feels good for you and your family. The other thing as well, and this can be for kids who aren't even able to communicate yet, but they can communicate using sign language. I might do a whole separate video if you would be interested in terms of how we use signs and some of the basic signs that I've teach, teach that I've taught both of my babies. Um, and Jess as well, actually, she used to sign quite a lot before she was even able to communicate certain things and still to this day like if something is hot or dangerous my kids will sign for it while they're telling me that it was hot <laughs> so it's really sweet and it's a really lovely way for if your child maybe isn't starting to use their words enough yet but they can actually tell you that they've had enough or they want more or please or thank you or it's a really lovely little thing to be to be doing and a really nice skill for your kid to have to give them the independence over their bodies and telling you what they want and don't want but when it comes to being all done you want to be your kid needs to be able to tell you that so if they're telling you that by throwing their food on the ground by giving them the tool of saying all done you know that means you've you've had enough dinner okay so you're coming back to the kid you're telling them like hey you know 
or throwing the food on the ground and you're saying like, hey, it looks like you're all done. Are you all done? If you're all done, it means it's time to tidy up and you're just casually taking them out of the chair. You're not making a big fuss about it because then obviously they won't want to continue that because they know that like, oh, when I throw food on the ground, like, you know, a big fuss is made over me and it's all this attention. I'm going to continue doing it. So instead you're just, oh, hey, it looks like you're all done. Time to get out of your chair and let's do some tidying up. And you just lift them up, pop them out, wipe them down, off they go. You're not making a fuss about it. You're moving on with the next step in the task. You're changing their focus from the throwing that they were doing to something else. Um, but I hope you find that helpful. So the next question that I got is, how do I stay calm when my little one is having a tantrum? And this is such a huge question. And I think I'm, like, I'm really proud of whoever it was to be able to even ask that because it's very normal for our kids to have tantrums, but equally it's normal for them to be difficult for us as adults and us as their guardians. So for me, uh, initially when my little ones started to have these massive big emotional meltdowns, I didn't know what to do. And my first instinct was to stop it. I wanted the crying to stop. I wanted the sound to stop. I wanted to take it away because I realized in, you know, sort of the unlearning of parenting and how I parented myself that I was a little misfix it. I wanted to take that bad feeling away like that. And if it wasn't stopping, so the sound wasn't stopping uh, from like a sensory perspective for me, or if it was a case of, you know, I just had other things to be doing and like I had to leave the supermarket and you can't just sit here on the floor and have a tantrum right now. Like A, it's embarrassing or B, it's like I have to keep going. I want to go get in the car because I've got to meet someone or I've got to go pay for our food or whatever it is. So the first thing was learning. First of all, it's okay. This is so okay. Your kid will cry. Your kid will have these emotional outbursts and it is good and it is developmentally normal and it is healthy. We want them to be able to express their feelings. What we want is for them to feel held and supported in that. So whatever you are doing in that moment, you can be pretty much guaranteed, unless it's like a safety issue that we need to get out of there because it's an unsafe place to be, that the most important thing is to just sit and be with your kid, to let them know that you are there, to let them know that it's okay, um, and that you see them and that they are heard, and no matter what their meltdown is for, that you are naming that for them, helping them work through it in a healthy way so if for you it's too much in that moment to sit and to be and to be present and to be able to regulate yourself you need to come back and figure out how you're going to regulate yourself first because you can't put your oxygen mask you, you can't put your kid's oxygen mask on unless you put your own on first so for me sometimes if I'm like up to here and I'm just already stressed I'm already anxious and I'm already having a day where I just cannot wait for bedtime because let's be real parenting is really hard sometimes and particularly gentle parenting I almost think is more difficult <laughs> so for me if I'm having a day like that and um, I allow myself an opportunity to take space first if I need to so I will outwardly say okay I'm just here but I'm just going to take a couple of moments for myself I'm just here and I will either turn my back for a second and just take a couple of deep breaths um you know really slow box breathing belly breathing super helpful you uh, might have noticed I've talked about um birth breathing on another video and that is something that I still practice in my day-to-day -day life but the idea is focusing on elongating the exhale and what you're doing is you're reminding your body you're reminding that inner child that you are safe and you're okay and you can calm down and sort of regulate uh, your nervous system by doing that quite easily so just even three slow deep breaths and you know taking the time if you need to then you're coming back and if you can't do anything or think of anything to do in that moment oftentimes I will regulate myself on the go so for me it's humming singing I will tell my child repeatedly you are okay I'm just here I'm just here and I'll sing it I'll say I'm just here you're okay I'm just here um or I will say you know uh, a friend of mine taught this like taught me this and it's not even something that's worthwhile teaching because you do it without even realizing but just the tutting just oh that's so hard that is so hard I see you that's so hard gosh you know you poor thing that's so hard so they're seen they're seen they're heard they feel supported um and they know that you're not going anywhere so taking the time taking a few deep breaths three might be all you need 
little bit of sing song, a little bit of humming, a little bit of repetition, all lovely ways to sort of regulate yourself on the go so that you can then be better present for your child to help them move through that difficult emotion. So the next question that I got is an epic one and that is about hitting. So this particular child is hitting their friend at play dates. Uh, it happens to be a smaller child and this mum is just not knowing what to do. And she it's she's saying that it's making her not want to go out to these play dates, which I completely empathise with. Nobody wants their child to be the child that's doing the hitting. But I want you to know that, again, it is all very much normal. Um, oftentimes it coincides with large changes in life. Um, so maybe you are moving house. Maybe there's a new sibling. Maybe it's to do with, um, you know, sleep changes that are going on, developmental changes that are happening, those big changes oftentimes come out in this way. So the way that I like to approach anything that our child or toddler does is from a place of empathy and understanding why that happens. And for me, I love to come back to the HALT acronym. So you're going through, starting from the very beginning, going to the very end and asking yourself, is your child hungry? Are they angry? Are they tired? or are they lonely? So for me, that means, okay, let's come back to, um, am I maybe too busy chatting to the adults that they maybe want a little bit of attention? Are we maybe coming up on nap, nap time? Are they maybe hungry or thirsty? So uh, in my case, I'm awful when I'm hungry. So you're making sure that you're addressing all of those needs. And sometimes it's as simple as that. It's simple as, hey, I saw you are so busy over there that I thought that I would, you know, give this child a little shove to see, can I get a reaction out of you so that I can have your attention? Or I'm just so unregulated that I just dis dysregulated that I need support with that. And this is the way that it's coming out because I've just got this pushing energy and this strong energy that I just need to get out. And I'm going to use it in a way that isn't appropriate. So the way that I will then deal with one of these moments is firstly, I come in in a really calm way if at all possible, I'll try and get in there before the push or shove actually happens and I will stop them and I will say, hey, I can see that you were just about to hit your friend there. We don't hit our friends. It's not a kind thing to do. I'm not going to let you do that. Um, and so standing in the way of that, making sure that you aren't giving a, a sort of drama to the situation, because of course, if you are giving more drama and more exposure to the situation, it's something that then there's more of a temptation to do. So you're staying calm, you're staying collected, making sure that you are checking in on that other child first. So that you're making sure that if there is some sort of energy being given towards the situation, it's not like, hey, I'm causing this drama and this excitement and I get a attention from mummy it's about demonstrating how we check in with our friends demonstrating that that wasn't a kind thing to do so doing a degree of sports casting around that hey I can see you really wanted mummy's attention and you went to go and push your friend there where you did push your friend there and that wasn't a very kind thing to do can you see how Bob is crying now you up really upset him. Let's go check in on our friend. And then you do it for them. So you'll notice in one of my other videos, I don't do like forced apologies for my children. Instead, I work on demonstrating and giving, giving an example of how that might look. So um, I would go over to Bob, I would get down to his level and I would say, hey, Bob, Atticus pushed you. That really wasn't kind of him. Are you okay? That looks really sore. And that shows Atticus that that wasn't a kind thing to do. Another thing that's worthwhile mentioning at this point is um, that I always make sure not to place disappointment or blame on my child. So we don't want them to feel like they have let you down in some way, shape or form. It's that self guilt, that the, the guilt of them, their own decisions that encourages them to change their actions. So instead of saying, Atticus, you pushed your child, I'm really disappointed in you. You can say something like, hey, you pushed your friend. I think you know that that wasn't an okay thing to do. So instead, they are forced to self-reflect, no matter what age they are, to encourage them to then in the future change their decisions, change their behaviour. The primary focus being on making sure that that child is safe, that they are okay. If your, your child con continues to persist and persists to try to push that, that other child, you can say to them like, hey, I can't let you do that. If you're not going to move your body yourself and give that child space, I'm going to help you. So you are physically then moving them to keep that other child safe. I hope that helps. So the next question is another really great one and it's about sleep. Uh, and so this family are currently nursing to sleep and they really want to get their kid to sleep in a cot. Um, 
for a period of time and while I'm not a pro at this because we are still doing bed sharing in our family and um, there are lots of, of tips and tricks that I have to share with you to help move or transition towards cot sleeping in a gentle way. The first one is supporting your child to sleep and understanding what is the norm. So when infants are first born, uh, there is a school of thought that believes that our children think that they are a part of us. They don't realize that they are a separate entity for quite a while. So for us, our job is to support them and guide them and helping them learn how to how to settle, how to fall asleep. And that is that that's our biggest role. So for you, that might be nursing to sleep. It might be a combination of other comfort techniques that you want to first overlay before then removing the nursing to sleep if that's not something that is maintainable for your family. So it might be overlaying a sound and a motion. So for us, that might look like shushing, rocking, white noise, bum patting, a lullaby, or a combination of these or just one and um, just one of each one sound and one movement and then what happens is once your child associates those other two associations with going to sleep you can then remove the nursing so that's a really nice way we call it habit stacking in the um, lactation and sleep world to help move your baby away from nursing to sleep to a more maintainable um, association so when it comes to actually getting them into their cot, I love to try at the side to sleep method, which is instead of laying your baby onto their back and plopping them down like this, where you're stimulating their morrow reflex, where they oftentimes will wake back up again, you are putting your baby in on, into the cot on their side first. And then once you know they're in a nice deep sleep, you can then very gently roll them over onto their backs. So we're now joined by a very sweaty abacus who's outside playing. Um, but the last technique that I have in terms of supporting your baby to sleep in their cot is to start by just trying one nap a day in the cot. So if the rest of the naps are maybe in a sling or in arms, that you're attempting one nap a day. And I always recommend starting with the morning nap, seeing as that is the nap that our infants are most likely to sleep out of arms with. So the next question then is about a child just not settling in the car. And this is something that we have absolutely dealt with, in particular with my eldest who's sitting in front of me here, but also with my uh, youngest, Archer, who still does not love the car and he's a year old. So some of the tools and techniques that we have used when um, we've been maybe having a long car journey or just before you even get into the car, we're already fussy, is to begin with looking at why is our child so unsettled. Sometimes it's to do with the time of the day, so they are just ready for a nap and they are just tired and ready to sleep. Sometimes it's to do with um, post-birth tone or tension issues, so there maybe have been some sort of torsion if your baby was a vacuum or a kiwi delivery, and maybe your baby was in the pelvis snuggled in there for quite a long period of time. And just in the same way that if you or I were sleeping in a funny position, we wake up with a crick in our neck, our babies can also be the same. So body work, baby massage, Mommy. giving lots of opportunity Mommy. for your baby to Mama. be outside of containers Mommy. to really just wriggle all of that tension out did you do some drawing good job I made this did you well done why don't you draw on this one my love why because I'm using this one the next thing then is just about regulating yourself so because you are driving a car with your little ones in it we have to make sure that you are taking time to mind yourself to make sure that you have the capacity to take those deep breaths to stop to regulate yourself in order that you can then support your child to regulate themselves so it might be getting out of the car it might be humming it might be saying something on repetition it might be opening the windows and just having a good sing song out the windows I also find that things like that can help your infants so if you are teaching them the tools by giving an example they then know how they can regulate them regulate themselves down the line so for slightly older infants it might be having a playlist that you listen to when you go for those car journeys it might be having listening to audiobooks I'll share some of my favorites down below there's a couple of really lovely ones particularly because we don't have tv so we really look forward to listening to audiobooks and we've tried quite a few of them the next thing then as well is having um stories so if your child is a bit older you can do imaginative stories as you're driving or you can introduce a little lovey for the car journey so you want to make sure that you are creating that lovely relationship and association the only thing i would say about introducing a lovey is to wake make sure that your child is old enough for one so generally around a year old and that if it's a specific one that you make sure you buy two of them in case you ever so i hope that you've enjoyed this video it's a little bit more 
more of a chatty style Q&A video and I hope you enjoy the part two of this as well um, and I hope that you found some of these helpful. One of the other questions that I did not get to was about resources so I'll make sure that I link some of my favourites in the description box for all of this gentle parenting series if you are looking for a little bit of support around some of these gentle parenting approaches or concepts and want to learn a little bit more. I will see you in the next one.